So what we just described is what happens within the cell. And a lot of that is probably quite theoretical. You're never going to see the channels open and the ions move. It's really hard to observe. What can we observe? We can observe from the outside looking in. Right? If there's a lot of electrical activity, we can observe that activity. And even if it moves around, if we're creative with where we look, we can see how it moves. So how can we observe some of the inner electrical movement of ions from the outside of the body? How can we observe the depolarization of cardiac muscle cells from the surface of the skin? With specific electrodes, we can observe the movement of um, that electrical charge or the, the change over time in that electrical charge. So I'm going to show you a simplified cell. This is one cell. You can imagine a number of cells together in sequence. You can imagine the entire heart. But for this first basic example, let's think of one cell. This entire box is the cell. Uh, the plasma membrane is the border of the box, but I'm focusing on this dark line up top first. The other gray lines are also plasma membrane. Inside the box is intracellular, outside is extracellular. In a resting situation, we've already acknowledged that there's a lot of potassium inside, a lot of sodium outside, but they're unequal so that there is a higher positive charge outside the cell than in. And so relatively, the outside is more positive than inside. If you measure the gradient across, it's a negative resting membrane potential of on the order of negative 90 millivolts. So this is a cell in a resting situation. The inside's more negative than the outside, and we can measure that with really fine-tipped electrodes. I'm going to use this individual cell as a proxy for the heart. All right? If this is one cell, if this is five cells in a row, if this is the entire heart, the principle or the concept is the same. So let's imagine when we discuss this single cell, the heart is overlaid on top of it. Where this is uh, the base or the top of the heart where the, um, the aorta comes out, the vena cava arrive. And then the right-hand side is the apex or the bottom of the heart, the point of the left ventricle um, where ultimately we, we observe the electricity moving to. And this is correct. The base of the heart is the top. It seems counterintuitive or backwards, but that's right. And the apex or the pointy part of the heart is the bottom. And it's aligned like this. So you can overlay the heart on top of this box if you want to. Now in a standard lead to ECG trace, you put electrodes at either end. Well, one electrode at the top, one electrode at the bottom. And so let's line up electrodes on this slide. If this single cell represents the entire heart, I've got two electrodes, one negative and one positive, negative at the base of the heart and positive at the apex. You can mix and match them if you want to. This is what gives you that stereotypical lead to ECG trace. If you flip them, it would just be upside down. We'll understand why that is in a second. So this is our normal situation. This is how we set up the external observation when we're doing a simple lead to ECG. Negative charge inside, positive charge outside. What happens when that cell depolarizes? We have a normal resting heart that all of a sudden receives a signal to depolarize. What's that signal? What does that prompt? What does that cause? Rapid influx of sodium. Remember, when it receives the signal, the voltage-gated sodium channels open, sodium rushes in. So we get this depolarization, this, this positive charge now inside the cell from sodium rushing in. And I expect, maybe you didn't catch the animation, but if a signal arrives, uh, arrives at the left-hand side, this would spread over the surface of the cell, gradually depolarizing areas that are not depolarized. So it would spread across the surface of the cell, and that's important. What we end up with is a wave of depolarization. 
moving from left to right. So understanding the deflection or what this trace looks like is a lot like adding integers. One plus one is two. Negative one minus one is negative two. If you add positives, you get a positive. If you add negatives, it becomes more negative. Here, depolarization is a positive wave. Sodium rushing into the cell makes the membrane potential more positive. And it does that at the left of the cell and then gradually more towards the right as it spreads across the membrane. It's a positive wave. So a positive wave moving across the membrane towards a positive electrode gives you an upwards deflection. If you are looking at the activity between these two points, if you're reading it, as this depolarization spreads across the membrane, it's going to look like this, an upward spike. And it might be long and drawn out if it's slow moving. It might be really tall if it's a powerful, um, uh, quick movement of, uh, of ions. But it's going to be an upwards deflection because depolarization is a positive wave. Positive ions move in. Membrane potential goes up. Positive wave towards a positive electrode gives an upwards deflection. Understanding this, you can understand the rest, no problem. Positive wave towards a positive electrode gives a positive deflection. And this is characteristic of the initial contraction. When the signal is sent down the septum between the ventricles and it reaches the apex of the heart, this is what's happening during the P and R waves. Massive movement towards the positive electrode. But when it gets to the tip, it spreads out around the walls and then comes back up towards the base of the heart. So let's imagine that we are at the apex. That signal is curling around the apex of the heart and now it's going in the other direction. What's that going to look like? Well, it's spreading around the walls, the outside of the ventricles. They're not depolarized yet. They still are in a normal resting situation. But now that wave is spreading from the apex up the sides of the heart back towards the base. Still depolarization. It's still a positive wave. Sodium rushes in. But now it's moving from the right hand side of the, the slide to the left. Positive wave towards a negative electrode is a negative deflection. It's the same movement of ions. Sodium rushes in, the inside becomes more positive, and it spreads in the direction of the negative electrode now. Positive wave towards a negative electrode gives a negative deflection. So the Q and the S waves are indicative of this on our ECG trace. The, uh, the cells depolarize away from the positive electrode. The one last tricky bit to wrap your head around is our return to a normal resting scenario. I think it's fairly, uh, fairly intuitive. Sodium rushes in, membrane potential is positive, it's a positive wave as it, as it spreads across the membrane. What happens when we pump those ions back into their appropriate compartments at rest. What happens when we repolarize the cell? Well, to repolarize, we start from a depolarized position. We start with a lot of sodium in, positive charge inside the cell, and we want to restore that back to normal. In this scenario, those ion pumps are working, they're moving sodium out, they're creating a more negative membrane potential. Repolarization is a negative wave. There's some argument as to how this actually works, but for our 
purposes, we are imagining repolarization starts at the end and moves back up. It um, repolarizes in reverse. So positive ions moving out is a negative wave. The inside of the cell becomes less positive. It becomes more polarized. So a negative wave towards a negative electrode gives an upwards deflection. So pumping out those positive ions, making the inside more negative, it's a negative wave. It's moving from right to left, negative wave towards a negative electrode. So it's a positive deflection. And this is one of the ways that we are content with describing this process because no matter if this is right or not, we always observe the T wave, which we know is the repolarization of the ventricles as an upwards deflection. We observe that. This is our attempts to explain it. And there's actually a lot of controversy over how it happens exactly in the heart. Some people will say, sure, it moves uh, in reverse order when it repolarizes. Some people say everything's hyperpolarized and it's a really slow infusion that spreads across the membrane and it happens to look like a positive deflection. This is how we're going to understand it, whether it's right or not. I think it's still being debated. Um, as of 2017, I have an article that I tried to use to look for the actual reason, but it's still hotly debated. We are understanding it as negative wave towards negative electrode gives an upwards deflection. Using these two points then, we can understand the gross movement of the electrical current through the heart. And you've probably seen uh, the setup of Einhoven's triangle before. This is the setup of a, a basic lead to ECG. We're gonna take the electrodes that we just used to understand the concept of waves and directionality. The negative electrode was on the left-hand side of the slide. It's gonna be on the right shoulder in Einhoven's triangle. The positive electrode is on the, the left hip negative to positive, we're measuring between those two points. And the third electrode on the left-hand shoulder is ground. It removes background noise. It's not in line with the movement of the electrical activity in the heart. It's perpendicular to the axis, and so it can account for any background noise that might make a fuzzy signal. The computer will automatically remove anything read by that electrode from the, uh, the signal we're reading across those two. So by setting up the lead to ECG as such, we create uh, an imaginary vector through the heart, an imaginary line connecting those two points through the heart. And ideally, it would fall right along the septum, splitting the ventricles, splitting the atria, and we can measure the net electrical activity. And as it spreads down towards the apex and out around the walls of the heart, we get a standard trace that we've seen before and you can explain. You know that the P wave is the depolarization of the atria. And then there's a brief break as that signal travels down into the ventricles. And then a massive spike as that wave propagates through the septum around the outside, squeezes the ventricles. The depolarization of the ventricles is an obvious characteristic of the lead to ECG. Then we have a little break and then everything repolarizes again and sets up for the next heartbeat. This is your understanding before coming into this course. This is, this is what we know about external observation of the heart's electrical activity. And you can take this and the next slide in your notes, I'm not going to go through it in detail, we'll um, move through step by step everything I just described. Follow the movement from the, um, the sinoatrial node, uh, where is it, right up here, these little yellow dots, in points one and two. The arrows show the movement of that signal, the uh, purple shaded area is when that signal is registered and contraction occurs. That contraction then transfers to the AV node down the walls of the ventricle. Contraction occurs in the ventricle. And you can see the corresponding shaded areas 
on the ECG trace to help with your understanding. But I won't go through that in detail because, well, I pretty much just did go through it in detail. I won't go through it in more detail. I'll let you do that on your own. This is simple. This is inadequate for understanding any other areas other than the, the line across the, uh, the septum of the heart. We get the net vector. We can't really tell what happens around the sides of the ventricles. We can't really tell where the initial signal comes from. If we have more information, we can pinpoint or we can evaluate, is the signal always originating at the SA node? Is there a delay at the AV node? Or is there a blockage? Are there multiple uh, foci, focuses, that are trying to initiate the cardiac cycle, that are competing? Is there a deficiency in uh, either the bundle branches, perhaps? If we have more information, that is, if we have more of those vectors, we can start to get a more complete uh, view of how the heart works in three dimensions. And so when we come back on Thursday, we are setting up the vectors in the 12 lead ECG. We're not only going to look in lead two, obliquely in the heart, we're going to look uh, horizontal, vertical, we're going to look in and out of the chest as well on multiple planes. So I'll show you how that's all set up when we get to class on Thursday. That will prepare you for setting it up in lab next week. And then in class next week, we're going to look at a ton of these traces. This will seem like Mickey Mouse by the time we're done next week, these lead to ECG traces. So I know that's been 